Harris, why don't we get started? Uh, I'll uh, first, I guess, introduce myself. Uh, my name is Sean Hall. I am the founder and president of the Life and Breath Foundation. Uh, the Life and Breath Foundation was uh, established in 1998 in memory of my mother, Ida Hall, who had pulmonary sarcoidosis. Um, I've been raising awareness and uh, helping families over the last 22 years. Uh, and uh, I am proud to present the latest uh, speaker series on growing the sarcoidosis patient's mindset. Um, we here at the foundation, our primary goals are to offer the sarcoidosis community effective tools to track their journey, decipher medical issues, and maximize their quality of life. To also provide a nurturing environment for those affected by sarcoidosis to share their experiences and also to build more awareness within the medical community to help combat this chronic disease. This evening, we're happy to have uh, Dr. Richard Harris uh, to join us. Dr. Harris is a physician and pharmacist with the Great Health and Wellness. He attended the University of Texas at Austin for pharmacy school, then pursued his medical education at the McGovern School of Medicine in Houston. Uh, Dr. Harris is a lifelong learner, completed his MBA at the University of Houston. He is a client-centric, he has a client-centric view focusing on building relationships and trust through a comprehensive lifestyle medicine system combined with genetic and micronutrient testing. He's also running an online health and wellness practice, is a partner in education consulting firm, and consults several different companies. Dr. Harris, welcome to the speaker series for the Life and Breath Foundation. Thank you for that wonderful introduction, Sean, and for allowing me to be back for a third time to speak to the Life and Breath Foundation. I guess I'm doing things right if you <laughs> invite me back <laughs> for, a, for round number three. Yes. So what we're gonna be talking about today is probably the most underrated yet most important aspect of health. So in my podcast, and you know, if you like what I say at the end, I'll have something where you can find me. But in my podcast, I talked about this with a Dr. Ron, Dr. Ching Ron, and he's one of the gurus of functional medicine. You know, if you're familiar with Mark Hyman or Chris Kresser or Jeffrey Bland, Dr. Ron is the, the next generation leader of the whole holistic and integrative medicine space. And on the podcast, we talked about his clinic and he has a dementia clinic. He has a cancer clinic. And he was talking about how the number one thing that was the determining factor in whether people got better was if they were able to form a new mindset and a new identity. And he, he compiled the data on this. He said it, it didn't matter what stage cancer they came in, what chemotherapy they were getting, what level of dementia. He said if they were able to form a new identity and a new mindset, that they were a person who could heal or overcome this, then that's when the healing came. And that's what all the quote unquote miracle cases, and he even said they're not miracles anymore because he sees them regularly. Every single time that person formed a new identity and a new mindset. And we're going to talk about the core of that mindset today, and that is the growth mindset. So this presentation was based on a book by Carol Dweck. And in the book, one of the things she says is, it's not always the people who start out the smartest who end up the smartest. And we're going to talk about the growth mindset and what that is, but in order to talk about the growth mindset, you have to understand what is the opposite of that, the fixed mindset. So in the fixed mindset, we believe a person's qualities, their traits, who they are, what they are made of cannot be changed. And so there are some things that come along with that and some assumptions that come along with that. But in the, and we'll talk about that more in a minute. In the growth mindset, however, this is an underlying belief that experience and time are the major factors in learning and intelligence. Meaning you can teach an old dog new tricks, meaning I may not be where I want to be today, 
I may not be the person that I, I want to be right now, but with time, with the right tools, I can grow into where I'm destined to be. So we're going to take you way back here to some examples of the growth mindset in my own life. And in second grade, I lived in Brussels in Belgium. This was in 1990, 1990, actually 1991. And this was a hugely new experience for me. Got plucked up from Cleveland, Ohio, moved overseas, and I fell in love with impressionist art. I had never drawn or thought about art or anything like that before, but I wanted to get better. And I told myself, you know what? I think I can get better at this if I just try and with the right coach. And so that's what I did. I would spend all this time drawing while I was over there. And I was a horrible artist, horrible. I can't even color inside the lines to this day. But with steady work, I got better because I had the right mindset. In seventh grade, this was the first time I could play sports. I had horrible asthma as a kid. I was on steroids. I was a chubby kid. I got made fun of a lot. Couldn't really do much. Couldn't go outside. I mean, I couldn't even jog down the block without developing an asthma episode. And then in seventh grade, it just went away. And the kids on the street played basketball. We had just moved to a new town. Again, I just made a bunch of new friends. They all played basketball. And I said, okay, well, maybe I should try and make the basketball team. Tried out in eighth grade, didn't make it. And instead of looking at myself like a failure or I'll never be able to do it, I told myself, what do I need to do to get better? And I came up with a game plan about how I'm going to get better. And so what I did was I went and played against kids better than me. So like, I'm not going to do, I'm not going to learn and get better if I play against kids who are at my same level. I need to play against kids who are better than me. And then I, I came up with a plan. I'm going to shoot for 10 minutes, dribble for 10 minutes, and then play defense for 10 minutes. I got a lot of really weird looks standing in my driveway, shuffling my feet when no one was there. But I went through a bunch of mental reps in my head, like playing defense in certain situations. And then in eighth grade, I tried out, or ninth grade, I tried out again for the team right before ninth grade. And I went from not being on the radar to people coming up to me during practice and, be, and saying, Richard, you're making us all look bad. None of us are going to make the team if you continue to go like this in practice. And that was mindset. Sophomore year in college, it, it happened again. I, I came to my college uh, counselor and, and asked, what do I need to do to get in pharmacy school? And they looked at me, looked at my transcript, my records, and said, you'll never get in. And I said, okay. And then I started asking myself, what do I need to do to get in? And I found a job in the dean of the pharmacy's lab. And that's how I got into pharmacy school. And the same thing with my MBA. In 2016, I decided to start an MBA program. I, people were looking at me like, you're crazy. You have a pharmacy degree. You have a medical degree. What do you need an MBA for? And I said, why not? Why limit myself? This opens up a whole realm of possibilities. And the reason I say this is to open you up to some real life examples of the growth mindset. But let's go back and talk about the fixed mindset, the opposite of the growth mindset. And in the fixed mindset, we believe failure is a lack of ability. And once a loser, once a failure, you're always a failure. Because in the fixed mindset, our abilities are literally fixed at birth. We can't get better. And so if I fail, that means I'm not good enough. It means that I'll always not be good enough. And then we'll do things that are not congruent with even our own moral compass. So one study with kids who are in the fixed mindset showed that they are 40% more likely to lie on a survey. So the survey had kids report their, how they did on a test. And the kids in the fixed mindset, 40% more of them lied saying they did better on the test than the kids in the growth mindset. And the reason you'll do this is to maintain your self-esteem. You're more likely to cheat or you'll seek out those who are worse to make yourself feel better. Now, remember in the story I just talked about, I talked about going to find people better than me to better myself. People in the fixed mindset are that misery loves company. They'll go find other people 
who are more miserable than them to make themselves feel better. Another thing that happens in the fixed mindset is intelligence is innate and defining. And so because of that, because I'm either smart or I'm not, you constantly have to prove yourself. Because if you can't gain new abilities, if you can't improve your intelligence, you become obsessed with perfection because that's a character trait. It's like, I'm, I'm smart. I have to continuously prove I'm smart. I want to be the smartest guy in the room. And this often happens when we're young, we get intelligence tests and it defines us. And we say, okay, I, get, I got praise because it's intelligence test. People are telling me I'm so smart. Then my identity becomes wrapped up in that. And so I must always be intelligent. I can never not be intelligent because that's who I am. That's so ingrained into my mindset. But we know that's not the case. Again, what did we start off this presentation saying? The people who start out the smartest don't often end up the smartest. And then there's a fear of looking unintelligent. There's a fear of looking like you don't have all the answers. There's a, it's a low effort state. And the reason it's a low effort state is because effort, if you have a fixed mindset, will reveal your inadequacies and therefore it's better not to make an effort because we're so afraid of looking at like a failure in the fixed mindset. We're so afraid of, of putting ourselves out there that we don't. It's better not to. And this you see classically in people that you know are capable of doing something. They just don't do it because they're too afraid of, of failing. They're too afraid of being looking at like a loser. And they're too afraid of their, their fixed traits being seen as an inadequacy. Because in the fixed mindset, you believe that inadequacy can never get better. The other thing that it does, if you try, then it robs you of the ability to blame. And one of the things that I'll talk about in a minute is why you know you're in the fixed mindset if you're blaming. And so if you put in effort, then you can't blame because you, you say, you know, a lot of times people say, well, you know, I could have done that if I tried. That's, that's what you'll hear about from people in the fixed mindset when they're blaming. Yo, I can easily do that, but I don't feel like it. You know, why bother? It's not worth my time. Those are the excuses that you'll hear. And then also they won't put in effort because effort is for, for people without ability. Because people with ability shouldn't have to put in effort. It should just come easy. And this is a trap that a lot of us fall into. Because especially with social media today, we just look at things and be like, oh my gosh, this person, the, the way they're doing it, it's so effortless and it comes to them so easy. And you may not see the snapshot. You, you only see the snapshot of what they want you to see. That person can be looking like it's effortless, but they're really tied down by a three ball and chains behind them that are out of the shot. Or they were lugging around those three ball and chains for years, and that's what made them strong. And finally, they got rid of it. So we have to be careful about when we compare ourselves to other people. And then we also have to be cognizant of the fact that innate ability isn't the end all be all and that we can learn and that we can grow. Another thing that happens in the sphere of looking unintelligent is we won't ask for help. You know, this is classically the man thing, right? Uh, the, all the, the memes and things like that. We're lost. No, no, we're not lost. No, I know where I'm going. Right? Because if I did, if I say, I don't know where I'm going or I'm lost, then that becomes a character flaw or a a personality defect. And in the fixed mindset, that can't be fixed. So now I feel unintelligent. I feel like I'm not worth something. But in the growth mindset, we ask for help. What did I talk about in that story? You know, I wouldn't found people better than me. I always ask for help in situations. And then in the fixed mindset, it's very alienating. Because if you get into a scenario like this, you don't ask for help. You won't put in effort. You won't try. You'll just withdraw into yourself. In the fixed mindset, we're only interested in being right. All that matters is be right. And then every time you make a mistake, your confidence decreases. How many times have we seen this where you've seen a kid or someone else you thought was really good at something, and then all of a sudden they just give it up? And you're like, whoa, you were really good at that. Like, what happened? 
and they made a mistake and then their confidence came down, made another mistake and the confidence and then made a third mistake. And I'm like, I can't do this anymore. I don't have the ability. And so they've done studies on this where they looked at people during tests and this can tell you if you're in a fixed mindset or not. The people in the fixed mindset only pay attention to questions they got right. And they did this by looking at brain waves. So you can tell by certain patterns if you're excited in the brain waves. And so when they looked at the questions, the fixed mindset of people's brain waves only spiked up when they looked at the questions they got right because it enhanced their self-esteem. It made them feel better about themselves. They didn't even look at the things that they got wrong. They didn't even care about trying to fix, trying to improve the things that are wrong. And this goes in with the next point. In the fixed mindset, one strike and you're out. You have to get it right on the first try or you lose interest. And then you have to keep getting it right. Because in the fixed mindset, you getting it right is associated with your own innate abilities that cannot change. And so once you get it wrong the first time, then it's, you know, I don't have enough ability and I can't get enough ability. So let me move on to something else. And another thing that we see is there is rumination on failures. And so uh, people with the fixed mindset actually have more depression. You know, a lot of the studies related to some of the social dis uh, discrepancies we see. So there is evidence that shows if you are a certain minority that's associated with a stereotype of being unintelligent, and in this group, they use African-American children. If they have on the test a checkbox that you check your race, the African-American kids did worse on the test just solely based upon that. But it was only those with the fixed mindset. The ones who didn't have the fixed mindset didn't do worse. But the ones who did, just being reminded of that stereotype was enough for them to do worse on the test. Because then all of a sudden, now that's in their head that, oh, I can't do this. I'm not good enough. And then when they think they're not good enough, then their performance follows. This is the same with women in science. If you put, if you look at a group in science classes, and there's a mix of men and women, the women with the fixed mindset do worse on the test because what's the stereotype there? Women aren't as good at science and math as men. We know that's not true. But when you put these, the, this, w these women with a group of men, they get reminded of the stereotype. And if they're in the fixed mindset, they perform to the stereotype. But the women who had the growth mindset did not have a drop in scores. And I think that's really interesting because it shows that our mindset affects our performance. Just like we talked about at the beginning, our mindset affects our health. If you want to know what the most dangerous thing for a human being to do health-wise is, most people think it's smoking. It's not smoking. It's social isolation. The hazard ratio, meaning the risk of something bad happening in a, a test group versus a, a group that doesn't have that condition for social isolation is higher than smoking. And that just shows you our mindset has tremendous effects on our body. How we breathe has effects on our health. Well, how we think about problems has effects on our health. Just like we talked about at the beginning, there's a reason I led with that story from Dr. Ron, because we're talking about horrible life-altering conditions, cancer, dementia. And the number one thing that he sees looking at his data is what mindset do people have? And we talk about it all the time. If you believe that you cannot be healed, you will never be healed. There's nothing anyone can do to heal you. But if you start to truly believe I can be healed, I can overcome this, I can do this, then the body can work miracles. And just like I said before, the miracle cases that Dr. Ron was seeing are not miracles anymore. He's seeing them all the time because he works with his people 
on their mindset, on becoming that person who believes that they can be healed. And this is so important for a disease like sarcoidosis, where there's so much that we don't know. There's so much that we're still trying to figure out. And the presentations are completely different. That no two people with sarcoid have the same experience or, or the same disease uh, impact. It might be different organs. It might be different, um, different, the disease might be more severe in some people rather than others. So that's why it's so important to have that right mindset. So let's talk about the growth mindset. And remember, we talked about blaming earlier, and this is one of my favorite quotes. You know, if you don't know who John Wooden is, he's one of the greatest basketball coaches of all time, did amazing things in the 60s with some of the, the most talent-loaded UCLA basketball teams ever. And John Wooden once said, you aren't a failure until you start to blame. That's when you know that you failed, because that's when you shifted into the fixed mindset. I always like to tell people, failure is a choice. And why do I say that? Because I can't control everything that happens to me, right? I can't control all the inputs that come in my life, but I can 100% control the outputs. The space between input and output is the space that we 100% own, and that's the space for growth. And that is the essence of the growth mindset. So what is, happens in the growth mindset? In the growth mindset, effort ignites ability. So we talked about in the fixed mindset that ability is something you're born with. You either have it or you don't. But in the growth mindset, the main thing, you, the question is, the main mantra is, who knows where I could end up with effort and time? Those are the major factors in my growth. It's how much effort and how much time. Again, the people who start the smartest aren't the ones who usually end up the smartest. So, all, of course, and I'm not saying that we don't have differences in innate ability. Of course we do. But the, the gaps can be shortened. Maybe you can even surpass depending on your effort and depending on how your mind thinks about a problem. Now, Einstein once said the most important part about the problem is how you frame the problem. How do we think about the problem? And the growth mindset, intelligence can be increased. And these traits are not defining. What I do does not define who I am. And this is something that we are really bad about. There's something called the fundamental attribution error. And that is basically... We assign character traits to people's actions. And one of these things is that if someone does something bad, they're a bad person. Say, for instance, someone cuts us off in traffic. What do we think? What's the first thing we think about when someone cuts us off in traffic? This person's an a-hole. I can't believe they would do that to me. This person's dangerous. Like, they're a bad person. They're a jerk. Now, notice all of those comments revolved around what that person did to you. None of those comments thought about what's going on in that other person's mind. What's that other person going through? Context matters. Our decisions are actually more contextually based than you think. Meaning now, whenever something like that happens, I think, well, maybe this person's rushing to the hospital to say goodbye to their loved one. Maybe this person has had an emergency that they're, that they're going towards. Maybe that person had a really bad day. Maybe they just got fired. There's so much that could be going on in that person that cause them to act that way. Maybe they are a jerk, but that's not the first thing I think about. I think about there's, oh, there's a whole host of reasons that I don't know why that person could be acting that way. In the growth mindset, we embrace challenges, and challenges are opportunities for growth. And what I tell people is related to health is no one has perfect health. No one. Everybody has things that they're going through. Now, even someone like me who's a holistic doc, I've, I've been dealing with IBS since I was a kid, insomnia since I was a kid, 
my spine is jacked up. I had a scoliosis. I never knew I had till I was 34. And then some other, I've had horrible allergies, asthma, all of these types of things. But each time something pops up, I look at it like, okay, this is a time for me to learn more about myself, learn more about what I'm going through. And then maybe I'm not going through this for me. Maybe I'm going through this to help somebody else out. Because I don't know what your religious beliefs are. I'm a Christian. I believe that sometimes we go through things not for ourselves, but to help out other people around us. Stories matter. Stories are powerful. And sometimes our stories are not for us. So just keep that in mind. So challenges are an opportunity for growth. And the growth mindset, you seek out help. You find people who have been where you are and they're further along. And you say, hey, how did you bridge this gap? How did you get there? What did you do? And you look at that like as an opportunity for you to improve your own skills, your own knowledge. And a lot of times because we're in the fixed mindset, we get jealous of that person or covet what that person has. But we don't know what that person went through to get there. They probably went through their own challenges and hardships and things like that, learned some lessons. And now those lessons they could pass on to us if we just ask for help. Most people, if they really care about you, which most of the time, most of the people in our life do, they will help us if you ask for help. One of the things that I always tell people is if you're trying to make a change in your life, you need the people around you to help you. We're not meant to do this alone. One of the things that I always tell people is that, hey, if you approach someone and, and say, you know, I'm going through this, I want to try this, I really need your help to do this. Will you do this with me? I think that is a powerful statement to get someone on board because you're vulnerable, you're asking for help. Now, in the growth mindset, we're interested in stretching knowledge, meaning we're, we look for knowledge gaps. I'm the type of person, I hate knowledge gaps. When I feel like I don't know something or I don't understand something, I've been known to dive into 13, 14 hour rabbit holes to figure something out. And that is... That is why we're always growing and reinventing ourselves. And so I don't let my current situation define me because it, it's not where I'm going to end up as long as I continue to go where I'm going. And then in the growth mindset, we look at adversity as a friend. We enjoy the difficulty because a good difficulty, again, is room for growth. It's like I said, the space between stimulus and response is the space for growth. And in the growth mindset, the search is meaningful. What I always tell people is, yes, we all want outcomes, but enjoy the process. There might be pain in the process, but there's, always, there's also power in the process and learning in the process. And I, this is something that I'm still going through all the time as, as an entrepreneur. Um, I've made a lot of mistakes. You know, everyone's made a lot of mistakes. Well, I've made a lot of mistakes. And I used to look at those mistakes from a fixed mindset perspective, like I'm not good enough. You know, because of being a fat kid and my parents' mental illness and my sister's mental illness and a lot of these other things that I've gone through, I didn't. I didn't have a lot of confidence in myself for a long time. And I didn't really think I'd be anything. And so some of that still comes back. You know, that old trauma still comes back, but I, I have to push it aside. A quote from William James, and this is one of my favorite quotes, is our best defense against anxiety is our ability to choose one thought over another. Often, people often say, well, you know, I can't just get this out of my head. I'm like, well, do you have aliens beaming thoughts into your head? No. Who's in control of every single thought that enters our head? We are. I am. I'm in control of every single thought that enters my head. Now, that doesn't mean negative thoughts don't enter my head. But what's happened is over time with thinking positive and retraining my thought processes, I cut them off. 
and I say, you know what, this is not as bad as I thought, or there's all there's 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 worse places that I could be. You know, one of the things that's pretty interesting is um, they've done research on people who have gone through traumatizing, horrible events, like getting paralyzed. And oftentimes to us on the outside, we could think, oh, my God, that could be the worst thing that would happen. I, I can't imagine what it's like to walk again. But about a year after those events, those people go back to where they were before the event. So if they were sad before the event, they go back to being sad. If they were happy people before the event, they go back to being happy. And guess what? We've seen miracle cases where people learn to walk again. They're the ones who are resilient in the growth mindset and happy. It's the same thing with lottery winners. Everybody thinks that if I won the lottery, I'd be happy. If I just had more money, I'd be happy. Well, those lottery winners go back to their baseline level of happiness about a year later as well. So if they were unhappy when they won the lottery, just having all that money doesn't suddenly magically make them more happy. They go back to where they were. If they were happy beforehand, they stay that way. So I kind of ramble. I go off on tangents. It's, it's kind of what I do. So we'll get back to talking about the growth mindset. On the growth mindset, you try harder on the ropes. And this is really important. I thought something that's really cool because we know people with chronic disease have higher rates of depression. And it's, I always tell people, listen, there's no thought that comes in your head that hasn't been thought of before. You're not the only person who's ever had that thought or that feeling. So that's one that, get, that keeps us from feeling isolated and alone in our own head. The other thing there is that it is perfectly normal to feel sad, to feel angry, to feel like you, you don't have any hope. Everybody experiences that sometimes. But it's what we do after that feeling that matters and what we say to ourselves after. You know, be like, this is pretty dark time right now, but I think it could get better. I think there's light on the other end of the tunnel. I always tell people, if you have those thoughts, those negative thoughts, make them a but statement. And that could be something like, you know what? I'm not at my ideal weight right now, but I'm going to get there or but I'm going to improve. Always in your thoughts on a positive because that retrains your brain to think more positive thoughts. There's a really good book called Hardwiring Happiness that talks about this about how if you can start to, for, if you can force yourself to think more positive thoughts, you will over time start to have more positive thoughts. And again, like we talked about Einstein earlier, you will start to reframe the problem in a new light. So people with the growth mindset, they still get depressed. That happens. The growth mindset is not going to keep you from getting depressed. But here's the really cool thing about having the growth mindset. When you have it, the people would say, yes, I feel depressed. Yes, they would test positive on depression tests. But what happened is they worked harder to maintain their normal activities while depressed. To pull themselves out of their depression by doing the things they still love, by doing the things that they thought were meaningful. And that is so important. Because again, everybody goes through these types of things depending on their situation. But if we retrain our mindset and how we look at things, it affects our output. You know, I'm a big fan of identity-based habits. If you've never read uh, Atomic Habits by James Clear, it's, it's a great book. And we in, in the book, it talks about how motivation isn't enough. We're not always going to have motivation. But if we form a new identity, that will get us through times we don't have motivation. The example I like to use is I am someone who works out. And because I am someone who works out, even on days that I don't want to go to the gym, because I don't want to go to the gym every day. I don't. I love the gym. But that probably means about 80% of the time I want to be there, 20% of the time I don't. But because my identity since I was 13 years old, as someone who goes to the gym, someone who works out, even the days where I don't want to go, 
I'm going to do things that are consistent with my own internal identity. And what does that mean? That means I may take me a while to get there. I may drag for a while, but I'm going to drag myself into the gym. This is not in that book, but this is another um, really good book. Malcolm Gladwell, all of his books are phenomenal, all of his, completely phenomenal, talks about outliers. And in outliers, we talk about people who are wildly successful. Typically, we think of it's an innate ability. Like we think that Steve Jobs was just better than all of us. Bill Gates was just better than all of us. Elon Musk is just better than all of us because it, it, it makes a good story. It makes, it makes it seem like there are mythical heroes. If you think back to every single society since the beginning of time has had these outlier stories, these stories of heroes, of extraordinary people who do extraordinary things. But what it talks about in this book was that most of it was due to dumb luck. They just ended up at the right place at the right time. Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, they were born during the right time right when the internet was starting to take off, when computers were starting to become available. Bill Gates, uh, one of the reasons why he was so successful is because he literally got to play on a new coding system before it was widely available. He happened to get a job at a university that had it, one of the few places in the world that you could have done that as a teenager. And he spent hours doing it. So again, these guys put in the effort did they have innate ability? Absolutely. But most of it was they were in the right place at the right time. But because of the effort that they put in, they were able to capitalize on that. And because of their mindset, how they looked at things, they were able to capitalize on that. And so this is just a picture of the book and, and Malcolm Gladwell. Highly suggest all of his books, Tipping Point, Blink, What the Dog Saw, uh, talking with strangers, they're all incredible. Mindset of a champion. How do we get the mindset of a champion? What's the Jordan mindset? Always ask why. Why is it this way? Why did you say that? You know, number one thing I, I tell my wife, or number one thing I say to my wife is, what do you mean by that? Number one thing. I probably say that to 70 to 80% of, of the things that she says, because I'm asking for clarification. So I understand completely what she means, because when we talk to people, we take what they say and we put it through our own filter. And then we think of something about how we would respond in that situation or be based upon our own context. Like we talked about earlier, we form an assumption and say something. But if I say, what did you mean by that? I can completely understand exactly what she means to say. Because a lot of the time she'll say something. And if I didn't ask that, I would misinterpret what she meant or what she wanted. And so always ask why. And ask why till you can't ask why anymore. You now really drill down on, on that root cause. And then character comes from mindset. And what this talks about is you generally in the fixed mindset when people act outlandish. Think about John McEnroe, right? He might have been the most talented tennis player of all time, but he had a fixed mindset. And that's why his performance was all over the place. You know, it's talked about that if he had a bad match, he would feel like a failure. Because he was so believed that his innate talent was so good that he should never lose. And he, should, he shouldn't really have to put in effort. All those things that we talked about. So your character comes from how you look at things. Again, I used that example earlier of someone cutting us off. Well, if someone cuts you off and then you road rage, your mindset is fixed because you're just looking at it from your perspective from taking what they did and transforming it through your own lens. But if you look at it from, man, I, I wonder if this person's really going through something. Now I'm not going to respond with anger. And then champions raise their level of play when the match is on the line. We've seen this time and time again. You know, the greatest players of all time. When the going gets tough, 
the tough gets going. They embrace the challenge. They love the challenge. And so when those moments happen, they're not stressed. That's what they live for. That's what they've prepared for. That's what they want. And that's part of the growth mindset. This is slides more for the growth mindset in business. Um, it's all about mentorship, developmental programs, praising effort, innovation, and then avoiding groupthink, not, not being able, not being afraid to talk up. You know, groupthink happens when the uh, when a leader is fixed, where dissent is punished, where the leader sees himself as a god that and knows all, and there's no critiquing. That's something that you see there. Relationships, this is huge because you can be in a relationship, you can be fixed, the relationship can be fixed, or um, the other person can be fixed. So there's three things that can be fixed. You want to avoid judging revenge blame. You know, what do they say about revenge? He who seeks revenge dig two graves. You want to focus on forgiveness, understanding, moving on. And this is even from relationships that don't work. You know, one of the key relationships in my life was a relationship that didn't work. But I wouldn't be where I am today without that person. They helped me through a really difficult time. I don't talk to that person anymore. But I learned a lot about what I needed to do from that relationship. You want to discuss rights and duties. This is so important. Because a lot of times we, we think that the other person owes us something that they should just get me, that they should just know what I want. No, no one can do that. We're not, not mind readers. So we need to discuss what we believe is a right in our relationships and what the duty that other person has. Like if, if I believe it's a right for me to get a hug every day or a kiss every day, and I believe that you know it's my significant other's duty to show that they love me every day. You know, we think these things are, are commonplace, but they're not. We're all different. We all come from different contexts, from different backgrounds. So you have to be open and discuss what you believe your rights are and what you believe that other person's duties are. And then a thing that's really important is that if you are getting in a new relationship, acknowledge that a new partner is a new set of problems. That's true for everybody. So one of the things that we see in relationships is, is bullies. Bullies tend to judge others so they feel superior. That's what people bully for. That's the fixed mindset. And then the fixed mindset, um, you're always feeling judged and you want revenge because you feel judged. And then you blame somebody else's character flaws and then feel anger and disgust when that person doesn't change. So that's to a, a vicious loop that we see in the fixed mindset. For parenting, it's all about the message. What are you actually praising? What are you saying to that person? And what are you saying about other people behind their backs? Kids are like sponges. They hear everything, they learn everything. They, their brains are literally designed to learn as much as possible from their environment. That's the way their brains are. So if you talk about someone else's kid in a fixed way, your kid is going to start thinking that you prioritize fixed thinking. So if you praise some other kid because of their intelligence, your kid is going to think it's important for them to be intelligent and do things just to be intelligent. You want to praise effort. And it's not saying that, you know, if the outcomes are bad, you still praise the effort. You still say, you say, hey, I know you tried really hard on this. But we need to think of some ways to, to improve because this outcome was not where we wanted it to be. So you don't call them a failure, say they're stupid or lazy. You still praise the effort, but you say we need better outcomes. How are we going to get better outcomes? And then you just be aware of what you're saying, how you're saying it, the environment, all of the things that we just talked about. This is something that's really interesting. A lot of people tell me I don't have willpower. Willpower is a muscle. It's been shown that you can expand your willpower. You can increase your willpower. Things like exercise, fasting, improve willpower. Making commitments, improve willpower. Reducing stress, setting smart goals. 
And then willpower is fatigable. That's why they say do the difficult thing first, because you have more willpower to do so. And then here are some quick ways that you can embrace or you can develop a fixed mindset. Number one, embrace your fixed mindset. You have to be aware of your fixed mindset. Be aware of when it's happening. Otherwise, you can't address it. Become aware of your triggers. I know what my triggers are that are going to send me down a fixed mindset. Carol Dweck recommends that you give that fixed mindset a persona. You know, if you get angry at certain things that you, you shouldn't get angry at, be like, oh, you know what? Steve's coming on again. What am I going to do about Steve? Right? So you become aware of your triggers. You identify those triggers. You make real your triggers. And then the step four is you take your triggers with you, meaning you're always on the lookout for them. You look out for their arrival. And then you educate your persona why that's not true anymore. You know, you feel Steve coming on and you say, you know what, Steve, I'm not that person anymore. You know, we don't think about that anymore like that, Steve. We're not going to do that like that anymore. That's not who we are. And then you want to set goals for growth, continued growth. I always have goals that I know I will never achieve, probably never achieve. I mean, never say never. But those goals, those big audacious goals that I break down into smart goals help keep me on a path that I'm going to continue to grow. So we leave time for questions. This is the final slide. Uh, this is my contact info, my Twitter and Instagram, the, my podcast name. And I saw earlier to put the link in the chat. So I just did that. And I saw that there's a couple questions. So the first one is, um, do, 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 let me see. Do you follow the five, four, three, two, one mindset? You know, in, there's a lot of different terms for all these different um, types of, of mindset methods. I personally think if the five, four, three, two, one method works for you, then do it. You know, if you, if um, meditation, deep breathing works for you, then do it. You know, there's, there's, no wrong that you can you can go for these types of things. Um, I personally believe that breathing exercises are very important. There is inf there is data that shows that breath work changes your brain function. Um, that changes your hormone levels. So, if you believe in the five, four, three, two, one, do it. A lot of people do the rule of threes. You know, does this matter in three minutes, three seconds, three years, three months? Right. And only focusing on the things that matter beyond that three month, three year period. You know, some we also ask, is it OK to hate your disease? I think it's I think it's OK to be. Upset about it, but I never think it's OK to hate because hate is such a strong word and it has some strong negative emotions. And what did we just talk about on this thing? Negative emotions negatively impact your mental and physical health. It's literally carrying weight on you, weight that's holding you down, weight that you don't need. And that weight can poison your mind and poison your body. So it, you can always think, you know, why me? Why this happened to me? You know, you can get sad about your disease, or your disease state, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I would try to focus on love, encouragement, happiness, and support rather than hate because I know how strong of a negative impact hate has on our mental and physical health. Your stress hormones will be all over the place. And that, especially for something like sarcoid, which is an autoimmune disease, is really bad for disease progression. It's so difficult to be positive during this time. What are some things people with sarcoidosis can do to improve their health? Sometimes I feel like there isn't anything I can do. Well, I am so glad that you came to the Life and Breath Foundation. This is a great resource. We have great speaker series talking about that very thing. We have speaker series on nutrition, speaker series on supplements, speaker series on 
how um, to, to navigate the whole disease. So there is always something that you can do, even though we don't know as much as we should about this disease. We know that you can optimize your nutrition. Getting sleep always helps. Getting some sunlight always helps. And just general health maintenance principles, how you think about the disease, how you feel about yourself. You know, so there are things that can you can do. And unfortunately, sometimes a lot of the stuff I'm talking about, most docs think is fluffy, think is not evidence-based. No, it's evidence-based. There's, I'm a 100% evidence-based physician. Everything I talk about, I have research backing it up. And there, like I said, about the social isolation, there's tons of research backing that up. So those are things that they may not have been studied specifically in sarcoid, but they have been studied specifically for improving our overall health. And if you improve your overall health, it's going to help improve your disease state. My family doesn't believe my symptoms are real. Do you have any suggestions to get them to know my symptoms are real so they can be more of a support? That's a really tough question. And this is something that I had went through with my mom as a kid. She didn't believe anything that I said. I actually broke my foot and um, she was like, you're, you're fine. I played three basketball games on a broken foot until my coach came to her and said, hey, Richard's been limping around for like three weeks. I think you should get him checked out. So it's, it's really sitting down with them and talking about those duties and rights that I talked about earlier and being very clear about what you want and what you need out of a relationship and then asking them the same thing. And then asking them, why don't you believe what I'm saying? What is it that, that, what is the underlying assumption behind the reason that I'm not getting support from you? And so if you sit down there and ask them in, in that way and talk to them in that way, then it opens up the conversation for meaningful dialogue. And I know in that situation, you can get resentful and get angry. Why doesn't this person believe me? You know, how can they do that to me? But now you fixed yourself. And because you fixed yourself, now that relationship is going to be fixed. And then that other person is more likely to be fixed towards you. So now where if you use some of the techniques we talked about in this a webinar to open up a growth mindset in yourself, then you can open up a growth mindset in your relationship. And then hopefully unlock a growth mindset in that relative. Uh, let's see. Wendy asks, we have had hardly any sunlight here in Rochester in the past two weeks. Any ideas? Yeah, there's a lot of artificial uh, sunlight lamps that you can get. You can also get uh, infrared panels. About 55% of the light that hits the earth is infrared. And so people will put red light. Um, uh, red lights in their face in the morning just to kind of mimic that. But that's something that you can do to help with um, areas like that where there, there is no sunlight. It's pretty, it's pretty interesting. Um, in places like Rochester in the northern latitudes, you make no vitamin D from pretty much October till about March. And so one of the things that people have started to do is use artificial light therapy, use infrared therapy to help get some of those natural responses. We increase our serotonin with sunlight, which increases our melatonin at night. So we sleep better. We get more of the happy neurotransmitters. Uh, we get um, the sunlight in, in the right doses. I mean, you can't overdo it. And it all depends on your, your skin tone and things like that. But sunlight's actually anti-inflammatory as well. Yes, we have a little bit more time left. Are there any more questions? Richard, I have one. Uh, yes. could, could you explain the process praise phase of maybe um, the growth mindset? Sure. So in process praise, we actually praise the process 
and the outcomes are secondary. Because a lot of times we think that the outcomes are only win or lose. There's actually a really good book by Simon Sinek called The Infinite Game, where he talks about life is not a win or lose process. We don't win life. We all die. So technically, <laughs> we, we all lose life, right? Because we all die. Right. But, but we can leave a lasting impact. We can leave a legacy. And that's how we win, quote unquote, win in the infinite game. And so it's all about that process. So if you are praising the process, what you're doing is saying, you know what? As I'm going through this, I am learning. I am growing. I am helping out other people. I am getting a reward from this process. Now, if you're only focused on the outcome, if the outcome doesn't go your way, then you'll think the entire thing was a failure and and a exercise in futility. But if you think about that way, that I'm learning, I'm growing, I am helping, I am I'm experiencing something new, then even if the outcome is bad, you still see that there was value in the process. And then you tweak the process, amend it, and then you try again. And sometimes that takes a, a lot of tries. You know why WD-40 is called WD-40? Because it was the 40th formula. They tried 40 <laughs> times to get it right. They didn't get it right until the 40th one. Yeah. And now one of the world's most ubiquitous products, everybody knows what WD-40 is. Yeah. What if they had given up at 27? What if they had not praised the process? They would have stopped. And then they wouldn't have made one of the most famous products ever made. Richard, very good point. And uh, trying to make a little connection here with want to uh, get your thoughts on it too. You know, some say 93% of the people that have sarcoidosis have to uh, find ways to manage that disease. So a lot of what you've spoken about tonight uh, is going to be beneficial for them as they go through their journey, possibly utilizing some of the things that life and breath can deliver additional information, things of that nature. Why is that so important? And especially why is it important as you interact with a caregiver or a family member or possibly someone in a support group that isn't privy to some of this mindset? Yeah, it's, um, it's so important to realize that there's more out there than anybody knows, right? And if you're not getting the answer from someone that you went to, there's always a way to find someone who can try to get you the answer to your question you're looking for. And I think that's so important to have resources like this who are thinking from things in a holistic perspective, because this is what life and breath is about. It's about holistic care and that we realize that, you know, not everyone's going to have access to certain things or, or certain connections. And, and we try to make that happen. But this is so important in a disease state like this that's, that's poorly understood that we, that we have a way to make connections and, and think about things from a different perspective. And I know it can be tough out there, like Ellen put from Debbie, how do you communicate with physicians who tend to dismiss your questions? We see that a lot, right? And this is one of those things where Sometimes I tell people, you have to stand up and, and be more firm. You have to flip the dynamic because physicians are really in a place of service. It's a, it's a service industry, healthcare service industry. And so they are there to serve you. You actually have all the power. It may not seem like it, but you do. How do you have the power? One, you can go to another physician. Two, you can seek a second opinion. Three, you can fire your physician, right? So you actually have all that power in that relationship and so you i tell patients be more demanding and get the answers that you want say no this is actually really important to me because a lot of times physicians we get at you have to think from again from that growth mindset perspective what's going through that physician's head if i've seen 30 people in that day how many questions have i answered that day hundreds hundreds of questions and so that physician might be fixed at that moment, might be burnt out. That happens. And so using what we talked about today to open that relationship up a little bit, I think, can help. I know that was a long-winded answer, but I, I, I thought it correlated with the question that Debbie asked. No, I thought it was very important. And I think a lot of, a lot of patients have that 
uh, as they try to seek out and, and get to the right person. You mentioned WD-40. Sometimes, you know, you may not have the right physician and you may need to seek other advice, you know? So I think the takeaway here is don't, don't stop, keep trying, keep per persevering um, and keep growing. Yeah. Uh, well, Dr. Harris, this has been tremendous. Uh, I took down so many notes uh, from this discussion and uh, we plan to have this um, taped and put on our YouTube uh, station so that everybody uh, can listen to it. We'll post it online also. Um, I loved a lot of the takeaways here. You gave some incredible uh, reading uh, information that we can go to, including Malcolm Gladwin and some other folks. So uh, again, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Harris, for this wonderful presentation. Uh, you can find out Dr. Harris's information that's in the chat. Um, the Life and Breath Foundation is always here. If you need to contact us, uh, please visit our website, www.lifeandbreath.org. You can use the info at lifeandbreath.org uh, to submit any questions, uh, comments. You need anything, we're here to help. Um, so I'd like to take this time to thank all of you for joining us. We had a really nice crowd tonight uh, to be able to listen in. Uh, we're looking forward to our next uh, speaker series, but Dr. Harris wanted to thank you from the bottom of our heart, from all the patients and their families. We appreciate your efforts and your sharing your time with us this evening. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, really, everyone who's listening, I'm praying for you. Uh, you guys are in our thoughts and uh, I know there's a lot of resources that Sean has worked diligently to put together to, to really help you. Um, I, I hope it came across in what he's done, how passionate he is for this and how much he cares about this. And uh, thank you, Sean, for your devotion, your dedication, and all your hard work. Well, thank you so much. Couldn't do it without you. Um, thank you, everybody, for, uh, for tuning in again, and we'll see you very soon. Have a good evening.